Hi everybody, it's Mark Scheller. So today I wanted to assemble a video showing the top 26 house defects that I see as I go around through these properties every year. So for weeks I've been assembling both my own field photos and also I'll include some stock photos in on the side so that you can follow along with me. So I'll be careful not to jibber jabber along for five or 15 minutes on each defect so that you're like, you know, I'll keep it moving, all right? But here's how I look at it. If an agent is new to the industry, anybody can open up the front door for you, they can turn on lights, they can gather a brochure, talk about the pretty wallpaper, the different colors, oh here's where your couch might go, okay? But I believe as a consumer that you deserve more. And so here's how it happens. We go around, we see properties, we can see most of these defects with our own eyes, we just need them to be trained a little bit, okay? And so if you don't discover these things, you make an offer on the property and then $500 and 10 days later with all these inspections, they come back and say, oh my, there's a crack in the foundation. That would have been something that would have been nice to know up front. Okay, so stay tuned. Those defects are coming to you. Okay, here's the county renowned Federal Pacific box. There were tens of thousands of these installed through the 70s and the 80s. If you discover one of these or your building inspector discovers one, he will demand, that's maybe a strong word, he will strongly encourage the seller to replace a Federal Pacific box. Okay, and because water and electricity do not mix, these GFIs have become prevalent, much more so than they were 20 years ago. So around water sources, certainly in lower levels and in garages, they should be GFI protected. So this one's aluminum wiring. So from about 1970 to 1974, the cost of copper was pretty high and so they switched to aluminum wiring. Now the main service feed, the grounding cable, all that will still be aluminum, but in most of the homes that you see it will be copper. But if all of the switches and receptacles are also aluminum, we need to have a strategy. This next one is open junction boxes with the DIY culture and people just watching a YouTube video thinking they can wire their house and also with Uncle George coming over, hey, I can rewire your house. It certainly is good to get an eye on these dangerous things, usually in the lower levels. Okay, so this one is double lugging. Under each breaker in the electric box are supposed to be one wire, but sometimes there's just too many switches and receptacles in a house and they get double lugged. You see the yellow arrows? Underneath each one of those screws are two wires and it's not supposed to be that way. And here are roof shingles. So as shingles age, they get thin. As they get thin, the sun bakes them and they start cupping upward like this. And as they cup upward, that creates thousands of leak paths for wind-driven rain to get into your sheathing. And here is an example of that wet sheathing. So even though there's no wet spots in your drywall upstairs yet, a lot of times roof leaks will show up years in advance in this wet sheathing as shown on this photograph. Here's wood floor that's cupping. So this is an example of an interior wood floor that's usually too close to a window. It could be too close to a heat vent. It could be right by the refrigerator to where the ice maker line has been leaking under it for months. And you can just tell where there's been water under it when it starts cupping like this. And we have areas where the water is getting in through a window, around a window, underneath some flashing, behind the brick, and it creates these mold spore type looking things, usually on the baseboard. Oftentimes it can get onto the subfloor in the basement. Broken window seals not to be confused with broken windows, okay? There's usually a thermal seal in between two panes of glass, and sometimes it looks all foggy as if someone just poured milk down between the panes of glass. So you can see here on the one side, there's a broken window seal as opposed to the clear functional window on the other side. Encroachments, all right, so during the survey process and even just going outside and looking around at some different curb cuts on the streets and things, a lot of times we can determine pretty close where the property lines are, if the neighbor's new retaining wall, if their brand new driveway, if their gazebo in the backyard is on your property line, that is something we need to know right away to prevent this referee situation. Asbestos in some of the older homes can be downstairs around the furnaces, the boilers, the heat ducts. What is the first syllable of asbestos? It's not good for us. Termites. Termites love to eat. Termites live in the ground and then we put food in the way of our houses on top of the termites. So they get in, a lot of times they're hidden behind drywall to where we cannot see them. But certainly in basement spaces and garage spaces, you can see where the termites 
have been getting in there and they've been munching. Arr, 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 arr. So here's an example of an outside radon pipe. Radon is a gas that gets into our homes, usually through our subfloors and our basements. And the EPA says high levels of radon are unhealthy to breathe. So between the testing equipment and actually the mitigation equipment, we'll figure it out. Here we have sewer laterals. Okay, the old sewer laterals that are 30, 40, 50 years old were clay tile. Clay tile pipes are very susceptible to tree roots that will penetrate and get inside and break them, okay? So especially in our older homes built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, these sewer laterals underground can pose an expensive repair. There are clues in the front yard if the sewer lateral is old or new. We also can call MSD and tell them the address and they'll give us a history of repairs for those things. These repairs are commonly in the three to nine thousand dollar range and it's good to know about them before you own the house and here's an example of a lateral crack or a diagonal crack in the foundation these almost always come in pairs almost always it's a result of pressure from the soil when the soil gets wet it expands it pushes on the side of that foundation wall they occur as sisters okay so even if there's drywall over one of them we can see the opposite one okay these are not a good type of crack and they usually involve some sort of expensive repair that I'll show a picture of it here shortly. This next one is a vertical crack in a foundation. Vertical cracks in the middle one third of any panel of the foundation often occur during construction and they are shrinkage cracks or what they call control joints, okay? We certainly don't want them to be passing water. We don't want any in and out deflection. We don't want any spread, but they are common in the middle one third, especially off of the sharp corners off of the windows in the basement. Here's an example of a vertical crack that's near a corner. This would be a prime example of a torsion crack. It's the foundation corner that is actually spinning. And this is a sister along with those lateral cracks that I mentioned before. So even in houses where we go downstairs and it's this beautiful finished $60,000 basement, it's all fancy. Even if we can see the top few inches of the foundation from the outside, we can usually get a pretty good example of the health of that foundation and how it's doing over time. Okay, so here's where a beam pocket has busted out on the side of a house. So the steel beam sits into this little pocket on the side wall of the home, okay? And when the side wall is moving in, the beam pocket breaks through this webbing and it's a pretty clear cut from the outside. It's like, what is that thing busting through there? But that's the steel beam inside which has shifted and it's actually blowing out the webbing of that foundation. And here's an example of how they install tie backs to help with this lateral pressure thing. Whenever these walls are bowing in and you get the two diagonal cracks, okay, they will, companies like Helitec, companies like Woods Basement, they will come out and they will install these helical anchors or sometimes they'll go into a dead man out in the yard. They space them six feet on center. They're $1,200 to $1,400 each. Does it fix it? Absolutely. Is it a challenge on future resale? Absolutely. So here we go. So here's an example of a repair for a house that's settling. Usually when a house is settling, that means vertical displacement, not lateral, okay? So this is an example of push piers that they've put down into the ground. There's also helical piers, which are basically big screws that they put down, and then they're able to support. Rarely do they lift the house, but they will support it down to bedrock to keep it from moving in the future. These piers are $1,800 a piece. Do they fix the problem? Almost always. Are they expensive? Almost always. Are they a concern on resale? Yes, but they're harder to see like the pretty, like the other picture with the big tie backs on the wall. So these are a little harder to diagnose. So normally I try not to talk about people's cracks, but when their heat exchanger is cracked, it's a big deal. Okay, so see an image of it here as a furnace gets old and it's gone through tens of thousands of hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold cycles. These heat exchangers inside the furnace, which are like hot plates standing up in the furnace, oftentimes just expansion contraction just and eventually they'll crack like this when they crack like this not only is it ugly but what it does is carbon monoxide can get into your breathing air and that's not right and here we have a sump pit with a sump 
pump in it, okay? There's a lot of confusion over these systems. When is it code? When do you have to have one? Should there be a sump pit in it? Should it have an exit pipe? Should there be a backflow thing into that? Aren't bugs and crickets and radon and things gonna get in my sump pump? So believe it or not, I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to this stuff and I would love to look at it. Here is the evaporator coil. It's the invisible part of the air conditioning system and it pairs with your unit outside. All of these little tubes and welds and all of these things in here, over time they get formicary corrosion. Ooh, fancy word, Mark, you know? And then the Freon or the Puron starts to leak out and your air conditioner stops working. So there are signals uh, inside the furnace when I open the front panel of the furnace off there are signals where I can see where there's problems with the evaporator coil these things are about a grand a piece and they're kind of hard to see so I will try really hard on every house there are dates on them and I'm able a lot of times to diagnose how old they are okay leaking water heaters most sellers will say oh that's not my water heater that is my air conditioner even in January, oh, that's my air conditioner. No, it's not the air conditioner. Most water heaters are made with glass liners. They are brittle. If they don't have the new big expansion tanks on the top just yet, which is now code, beep, 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 code, then a lot of times those water heaters can crack. And here's an example of a pond forming in a basement.